I feel like a bit of an idiot right now because I made a public statement about um, the DS being total dog shit. I disagree with that. <laughs> I saw that online. Uh, what's it? Uh, there was one. I, I can't somebody posted a picture of I DS. Po I, po I posted a picture. And someone said, I don't see it. I, oh, and Bertrand wrote back, like, I don't see it either, something like that. Yeah. yeah so they, I, 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 the, I, the, the car's parked on my street, and I've got this, 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 this pet peeve with, with um, rightly or wrongly so, with some people saying, like, this car, not necessarily the DS, but, like, certain Italian cars that were ugly, that, that I feel that sometimes there's, a, there's a, a cult of people that latch onto something and they try and say like, oh, I really like that as to try and illustrate some sort of uh, artificial sophistication. So what means, you, I'll let you go back to your sentence, but let me just I intercept it. That means that you kind of like holding back on the DS because you feel that that's sort of like a standard that other people just approve of for the sake of approving of it, or? I, I Okay, number one, I, I don't see the appeal at all. I understand the timing and that a lot of people, uh, are, people are talking about, uh, one of the things that's really, that that's, that's coming up time and time again is the word spaceship. If you consider the other things from that time. The other thing that's come up from a couple of different people as well is the transition from the, the fender into the body side. Wow. Um, and, but I just, I look at this thing on my street because there's one that's parked on my street permanently. And it just, to me, I'm going to get crucified for this. No. It looks like a fat fish just coming up to bask for air. You so know? let's agree on the fact that it's on the ugly wall, right? Right. So that means I don't think it's ugly, but that's again, my point is I, all I said right now is I really, it's like. Our children, like it's like our drawings. It's all the cars that were ever made. I don't think there's an ugly car out there. Right. I don't think there is. There are people that put their heart and soul into every car on the road. You know, yes, there are cars that are bland and blah, blah, blah. But aren't those the Britney Spears cars? The ones that were made to cater to other people's tastes? You know, people having too many... Uh, Uh, car clinics and trying to understand what people like. Oh, they don't like this kind of a sh shape of a taillight. So let's change it. You know, so we appeal to the most people. Isn't that the stuff that lands on the uh, in landfill of, of visual whatever? You know, so what I think the DS, we can argue on it. Um, I even, I post the image of the Ferrari Mitos as a concept car. yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I even saw that Sasha and Daniel were getting in there like, oh, I don't really like it. What I was, I was like, well, you know what the value of it is? We're talking about it. We're honoring the, the hours that went into it by people that put their heart and soul into it. That's the real value of it. It doesn't matter. Because my kids like other music that I like. You know, that, that's okay too. You know, and I asked them, what do you hear in that music? Whatever, and I try and learn from it. So it's a little bit back to, why I like to work with someone like Chris, because he doesn't come on to you with like, okay, I'm a guy who wants a car like this. Please fulfill my fantasy. He would never say that. He would ask you, what, what kind of music do you like? What kind of art do you like? Uh, what kind of cars do you like? Why do you respond? I mean, that's the one main reason why I also joined uh, uh, Borgwart uh, after BMW, because I wanted to go into that world where I wanted to try and help a brand that had been slumbering obviously for many, many years uh, to go to new heights because people know the history of the brand and the interest. In, they know that that was a real fight for this brand in the late 50s. And unfortunately they went south in the early 60s uh, in Bremen. And, and, but they were exported to America at the time and they were, they were around and they were interesting cars. It was an interesting brand like so many other cars in the 50s. Then I felt like, oh, this what a great opportunity. And, you know, the Isabella was the most famous Borgwart anyway. So we said, well, what if we create a future vision of a German brand with electrification, reviving this heritage from this old brand? And, but doing it in a new way, obviously, not like a copy of the old car, but doing a new way. And, and um, so a lot of people like, well, I don't get it. What's with... What's with this brand? And I say, well, the real value is we're talking about it. 
you know, we're honoring the time and the heart and soul that went into it from somebody else. And that's removing yourself from the purpose of, of my car or, you know, only thing. It's, it's about bringing up, you know, the, 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 the colorful variation of cars out there. Uh, I love discussing cars. I mean, a good friend of mine, uh, Soren Essendrup, who lives in uh, Denmark, he's, he's got these like very particular cars, like Porsche 928. I, I'm sure we can agree on that's an amazing car, but not everybody thinks that or thought that at the time anyways. They should. Yeah, it's an amazing car. I agree. But at the time, it was a little bit of a problem car, right? For the amount of in, in, uh, innovation that went into the car, visual, uh, technical innovation, also a different kind of a market, catering more to the American market, whatever. So 9, 928 is super interesting. Another car that Soren just bought right now is the uh, BMW Z1, which is also a very, very niche car. And a lot of people are like, I don't really get it. I'm like, that doesn't matter. It's on the side of the non-Britney Spears cars, you know. These are cars with statement, with heart and soul, where, you know, Harm Lagai and his team and Uli Bates uh, for, at BMW, at BMW Technik in the, in, in the uh, end of 80s, early 90s, uh, end of 80s, um, went through and developed these cars with, like I say, purpose, with, 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 with styling, with, with heart and soul, you know. So these are the cars I like that respond to, whether it's a BMW, whether it's a, a, a Mini or a Borgwart, the brands that I've been lucky to work for, um, or even I also worked for Volkswagen, you know, for, uh, for a while and Bugatti for a while. And, and I don't mind, uh, I like everything that people do. That's the thing. I don't, I don't, I get, I get a little bit, obviously, um, like everybody else, if things are maybe a little bit too over the top, then it's, uh, it's really necessary to go all the way. On the other hand, I kind of applaud that. It's like if someone's got a free run for the goal, why should you say, hey, wait for us? He's got the ball, shoot the goal. If you're out there, you know, play it, do it. Um, one thing that I really, and this is job that I think as a designer that I have, that I really try to work towards every day, is to uh, come up with ideas that are remarkable, support ideas that are remarkable, support other people's remarkable ideas that might not even be my preference, because who am I to judge? You know, who am I to say that what you draw is not good? What do I know? It's not, I'm not here to judge. I will judge um, marketing cars. I will judge design by committee cars. I will judge um, uh, cars that uh, clearly have been changed, be you know, they had character and then we had a design clinic and then all the good stuff got, you know, because that's what people came around the corner, saw the taillights, I go, whoa, that's a new taillight, as if new is bad, right? New taillight, you know, markets and go like, oh, new taillight minus. What do you mean? He just noticed a car. Why should we take the taillight out? Well, they responded negatively uh, in 60%, uh, whatever, responded negatively to the taillight, so please change the lines. That I opt against. That, that's uh, Stock Aitken and Waterman, you know, pop music, you know, like how many people can we appeal to, you know. But again, this is a beautiful thing, talking about music, you know. I was just thinking the other day about the, the, um, the because you, you kind of think of films, 80s films, cheesy, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you go into really music that changed, I'm, I'm a kid of the 80s, so that's kind of my, you know, obviously catalog. But the stuff that, that, that stood out, I mean, I was all into Prince and all that kind of stuff, stuff that really stood out. But if you think about the synth pop from the 80s, like Communards and Eurasia, whatever, these are people that are just, they are on this wall. They just do what they believe in. They don't try to cater to anyone. And that's the music that stays, in my view, uh, whether I like it or not. I do like it because I like the statements of it. Um, so I was, that's why I was saying uh, the other day, someone was talking about the movie Top Gun, obviously. I mean, what a great failure. Want to do a Top Gun 2 or whatever, because you can't win with that anyways. But I was just thinking about the uh, song from, from, from Top Gun, uh, Take My Breath Away, Berlin, yeah. whatever, which is kind of a ballad, kind of blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, I, I like that song a lot. Dude, I that if, if I hear I wasn't I wasn't necessarily a big fan of that that era, but if I 
listen to that song, it takes me back to like five years old or four years old in my first house. Like I remember the feeling, the smells, everything from, it's just, it's a very, it transports me. Yeah. The interesting thing, and I love you saying that because this is your personal story about it, is that you can't argue taste on that song. No. There would be hundred people right now telling me like, well, that's a cheesy song. And I'll say, you know what? I don't care. The thing is, there's, it's even Top Gun. I mean, that's the cheesiest movie of all time, right? You know, Maverick and Goose and all that stuff. It's, it doesn't get more cheesy than that. But the song was made by Berlin and it was, you know, real mu musicians in their studio making their music for themselves. I don't think they even knew that was become the feature song of the, uh, of the movie anyways. So that's what I'm getting to. When, back to car design, when we got a pen in our hand, we're in our music studio. And we should not think about where our song should be featured in what movie. We should think about what we, what's the purpose of our vision for a car, whether it's a Mini, whether it's a Borgward, whether it's a Renault. You know. that's, that's what we need to bear in mind when we try and cater this to stupid fucking algorithms and stuff like that. Like, well, here's the thing. Algorithm is the new word for peers, right? Which back in school, Back in the 80s, 90s, whatever, when we were art, going to art school, we wanted, obviously, an art, art center was like that. You know, I was like that. Sorry, I'm, 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 I'm people that know me from art center, right? Soren, Craig Kember, John Fry, those guys. They know me, uh, Jose Visegrod. They know that I was kind of a, I was very, I was very, um, I made sure my, 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 I had sketches all over. And basically from the floor to the ceiling, although I mean, a little bit competitive, right? So I wanted to, I also made sure that I got in there because school is at nine o'clock in California. People come in five to nine and go, like, oh, where can I hang my sketches? I was there before eight and I hawked all the wall, right? Because I wanted to impress not only the, the, the teachers, but also the other students. And hopefully if some guy from Ford came through or whatever, he'd also see, oh, Anders, he's got the whole wall kind of thing. Even to a point at Art Center Europe that I built my own wall. Back to, that's why the reference to, uh, we had a big um, uh, presentation room and I knew I had so many sketches and people thought I was slightly arrogant because the volume of sketches that I had. Uh, oh man, Anders is going to take all the walls again, right? So what I did was I went to the art store the night before and I bought all these foam core boards myself. And I built a wall right down the middle of the, of the classrooms. I actually have a picture of that right now. Oh, oh it's still somewhere. Of, I, you know, so I built my own wall for my own sketches. Now, why, why do I say that when, when, when you're talking about uh, uh, social media is that it's the same thing. You know, you, I think that, 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 that anyone who, who uh, posts likes the feedback like when people come to art school and walk around uh, walk around a corner see your wall of sketches and go like oh that's cool you know that's cool and walk up and say oh how did you do that it's the same as someone like stopping going whoa like you know that's that approval that you're looking for which is in music which is in sports it's anywhere and i think it's i think it's a healthy driver as well that 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 you you i I would love to show you stuff. And, and Sam goes like, Anders, that's cool. And I go like, yeah, I like that. I, d I don't care who you are. You know, I even heard about when Paul McCartney was doing the, the, um, the soundtrack to a Vanilla Sky, like early 2000s, whatever. And he'd gone to, uh, what this also named Sam, Sam, so, uh, the director of Vanilla Sky. Anyways, but he had asked McCartney to do a theme song for the, and uh, and then this guy he leans back and he goes like, Paul, I'm not feeling it. <laughs> you say that to Paul McCartney, right? So apparently he flew back to England. He's like, I'm gonna get this guy. I want this song to be. And then he came up with a theme song and it went through the roof, kind of thing. Uh, uh, in the regard that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Paul McCartney, you still want to impress. You know, why do you think Sting went and did uh, every breath you take retake with Puff Daddy or whatever? You know to mm. get a new audience, mm. you know, with the kids. So I don't, I think, um, I think the algorithms are there as a sign for approval and for, for people to, to respond. 
And it, but it's not responding as far as marketing stats and Britney Spears. Yeah. It's culturally res responding, and it's a it's a it's a volatile thing as well. I make a sketch, and um, and um, I thought it was great, and you walk by and you go like eh, meh, and I'm like, but I really put a lot of heart and soul into it, meh, whatever. And then I do this one. Do I remember? Actually, I was posted. I posted a sketch um, on Instagram a while back, and it was just a doodle. It literally was four or five lines of of a side. I mean, sports car silhouette. Come on. I mean, this like I was. I was having fun sketching it. It was great, you know, and um, people really liked it. And then I do this other thing where I really try to make it, you know, and people like me, you know, a lot of thought into it, me. But this, I really like that. And that's, like I say, there's something magical about art, you know, that uh, that um, that Picasso painting with like two lines, and you go like, wow. I mean, I think anyone who's ever been to uh, Paris has to go to the Pica uh, Picasso Museum anyways. And you go there in Paris in the Picasso Museum, you just like, it floors you, you know. You know, just it... I don't know. There's something magical about the, the 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 purposefulness and the human approach of how he was doing stuff. Still, as we know, wanting to um, be loved by his peers. Like apparently, he'd gone to Matisse's house or whatever, showing him stuff and say, "Please, Matisse, love my paintings." You know, and you kind of go like, "You're Picasso. You don't need anyone else to love you. You're Paul McCartney. You you're fine." That's that's not the elixir of life you know it's basically that um so i understand the social media thing i understand the the algorithms i understand that as a driver of our time now and i also think it's very truthful it can be as well but it depends on whether or not um i think it depends on what you're doing i mean if i if i'm talking about this podcast for example there's a, set, a certain set of core things that i really would like to achieve with it and I would rather have, um, of course, you want it to grow to a certain level, but I'd rather have like, I don't know, a thousand people that fucking love it uh, than, you know, 10 times that amount that I are like. I completely agree. But then, the, then we exactly we're back to that point about this wall and that wall. You know, this one wall probably sells more cars, maybe even more profitably, right? But we like that. A guy like Benoit or a guy like Marek, whatever, walk up and go like Anders. I really actually that's what happened with the Z4, by the way. You know, a guy like Mary Georgievich came by with his espresso and looks over my sketch and goes like, "That's really cool." And you just like, "Thanks, Marek." You know, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> you know, that was the in the first, actually the funny thing is was uh, this is a true. I, I told this actually in another podcast I was doing, but. Um, Mary Georgievich, who I absolutely admire, anyways, um, as a designer, as a human, uh, and he he actually had gotten selected by Chris and by Henrik. I think they decided that he was going to do a Z4, or back at the time it was called a Z3 successor. So he was going to do a Z3 successor. And Chapman was going to do a coupe, and he was going to do the open one. So that was, you're going to do a scale model, you're going to do a scale model. And I was sitting on the side. Then I started doing my this sketchy stuff, the ones where I showed you that Chris has those sketches on as well, and um, and uh, I started doing these sketches, and then uh, Georgievich was beginning to talk about the roles, the Phantom uh, getting because at the time there was rumors that BMW maybe were buying Rolls Royce and all that kind of stuff, so uh, he started the project whatever, and then he was kind of like in his mind there apparently, and. Um, and literally, he came by and he looked at my sketches. True story. And he goes like, with a, his espresso, of course, he goes like, this is cool. This is really cool. I really like this stuff. And he, and he went to Henrik. And he says, I don't want to do a scale model. Let Anders do the scale model. That was cool. No, it's true. Uh, he literally, I mean, he had, he had some uh, Z3 successor sketches. He's like, I'm not feeling it. Let me focus on my roles. Let Anders do the Z4, or the Z3 successor. Then I did the first stuff. Now I'm back to that story again. But then I did the first stuff, and we had a telephone call with with Munich, and they were like, "Yeah, whatever you do, make sure it's a Z3 successor." And Henrik looked at me, he goes like, because it was on the phone, so nobody could see you. He goes like, 
Yeah, okay, we make it look like a Z3 successor. You know, no, we just do our own thing, flame surfacing all the way. Was that not, sorry, no, 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 just yeah. carry on. So what happened is, remember your question, but it's just anecdote on that. We did, we sold flame surfacing as a story at, flanked by the Z4 and Henrik did a, did a coupe or something, whatever. So we had different versions of the form language applied to cars. We flew that to Munich. Here in Munich had a presentation late night before Christmas to Chris Bangle that then saw it the first time, right? So we were saying, okay, Henrik was our boss and, and, and we were doing the design and I was, we had these, so we'd done moody shots of twisted stuff. We'd done moody stuff uh, with Darren Yasakochi, the photographer from DesignWorks. He was doing these moody images up close of twisted shapes, black background, just forms. So we had, uh, I think, 10 huge square posters hang in the, in the room as a context. And then we had the two full-size cars with the flame surfacing on it. We didn't call it flame at the time. but So we had a, a late year presentation to Chris, and he came in just before Christmas. He said, ah, show me what you got. Ah. And I look at it, and, 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 and we uncovered it, and we explained. So Chris, this is about the form language. We do this and do He's like, oh, oh, I love it. Turn off the lights, turn off the lights. So the guy went over the corner, you know, turn off these long, uh, or the regular lights. So you just had these long stripes light. He goes like, your form language is like flames. And we're like, really? He goes like, look, it's like a, a symphony. He, he went to the Z4 and it's like a front uh, about the blinker. He goes like, and there's the violins, highlights. And then there's like the cellos. And then look at that symphony. And it's like, it's like flames on the surface. Uh, it's like we we'll call it flame surfacing. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> that was it. Wow, that's good. Wow. No, not it, but it was it was it was a, a special evening. And then we went for pizza afterwards with Chris. It was cool. What was your favorite? Do you have a project that's your favorite? I mean, I obviously uh, the Z4 uh, changed my life because I was surrounded by these people. Chris and Merrick and uh, Chapman and uh, Henrik and those guys. So that was a pivotal moment i would say but my favorite car uh, actually the favorite cars that i've been involved in actually especially the ones that i was allowed to do here the last couple of years so i would say i have my three favorite cars uh um uh, concept cars the mini next 100 is still for me such an amazing experience great people great mini next 100 uh second one is the mini superleggera that we did together with louis down at uh, uh to touring you know the superleggera mini because it was it was also a kind of my dream car i always wanted to do a an expensive mini roadster so i went to um to adrian and he went to mr dees with this i said come on let's uh, let's do this and adrian really liked it and then we got the contact to those guys so it was kind of a big push for me on the exterior side from the front and then we you know integrated in a great teamwork with touring so that's the second one that always comes to my mind yeah. can i ask you a question just on that subject alone like how resolved do you have to have your idea or concept before you go to your boss and say like this could be really fucking cool um it's basically it's got to go through the, the the you know my own approval as far as the sketch goes once you hit print you know i would say once you you go to the copy printer and you pick it up it's got to be good enough to be shown i mean they always say in art school never hang up stuff on the wall you don't want to have picked so make sure when you hit you know squiggle p but it could be enough to just go with the sketch no that's fine but oh. i mean you also know that those doodles can be as as telling as a perfect rendering or whatever so but once you you finish a sketch or you go to collect it from the printer you obviously have to go through the filter of like do you even want this picked? Is it good enough? Anyways, so that's kind of the filter. And I'm, I mean, I'm usually happy with what I do. So I was like, yeah, build it, you know, let's do it. Usually when I sketch stuff, I know we can turn around and build it. That's kind of like my own ambition to say, I don't want to just do, I'm, I do want to do, you know, abstract stuff. But if you ask me to do that, actually, I don't know if you saw that, I did this uh, thing I call driving architecture, which is this mm, driving yeah, box thing. Yeah. That thing is weird wacky in a good way like i haven't seen that before that's where my mind starts going what then if a guy comes to me from a model building come and say well let's build this thing then i could turn around and build it in a second 
It's buildable. It's selectable. Like a boss could say, I like it. And you can also do that's, you know, you got to have that. But I, I like stuff that is more on this wall here, like that makes me think about what's the future of car design. And the third car that I will never, uh, anyways, live is the Borgward Isabella we did for Frankfurt Motor Show here at, in 2017. That's oh. sort of, it's such a, yeah, it's just a dream car for me to be able to do that from scratch with the guys. And, and the interior is amazing. Exterior is just, I, I think, I mean, the idea of this was basically say, if this brand has to resurface, it's not about fulfilling these criteria it should fulfill an emotional and cultural criteria not a sales volume criteria so our idea was to say uh we knew at the time that the tycon was coming mission e as it was called at the time so our idea was to say okay you know obviously german sporty so say okay what if we do like a, a bootleg uh tycon you know a lower um, not like a three series BMW height or Audi A4 or Audi A7 height, but something that's even lower, even more sporty, fully electric, highly emotional, a lot of aerodynamic features. And that's, and since the name Isabella, Borgwart Isabella, Isabella, the word has a Bella in it, it's just a, you know, a beautiful, voluptuous shape. And then you can say, well, didn't you say you don't like beautiful cars? Well, I think a lot of people don't think it's fulfilling the, Heidi Klum criteria of beauty. It is an acquired taste. So it is a super interesting car. But, I mean, I would wish for you and everybody else, go back and look at that car. I will. Be, I will. I will. Spo, spend, I know it kind of got it overlooked a little bit. I have no beef about that. That's fine. You know, whatever. But it's kind of like the B-side of a good album where you go like, you know, that song was really good. And why? Well... And then you listen, you go like, that was actually my favorite song. So for me, that's, um, that's, that's my, yeah, that is my favorite car because it was also like a major commitment from everybody involved. It was just such a, like, we believed in it, truly. That's what I said with the Mini Next 100 as well. It's like a car we believed in. Not a thing you did, oh, let's do a concept car kind of thing. It's something like, please, can we do it like this? You know, and it's, it's, there's a drive behind it from, from the inside which we had on the Isabella, which we had on the minis. So these two minis and the Isabella, those definitely stand out. And obviously Gina, obviously uh, Mille Miglia, BMWs or BMW Z4, you know, BMW X Coupe, whatever. These are, these are um, things that stand out, obviously, as early part of my career. But let's say what's cool about the Mini X100 the Mini Superleggera and the Borgward Isabella is that it's an interior and exterior exercise in all three cases. It's the full car. User interface, experience, seats, ingress, egress. Um, it's not just a pretty face exterior kind of thing. For my style, so my contribution, you know, as years have gone on, I've been so excited to do a lot of interior work as well. It always seems like a chore, but quite on the contrary. At Mini, I spent, I think, 65 or 70% of my time on interior, on the new Mini Clubman, whatever. You know, we spent a lot of time on the interior. The partitions, the quality of the materials, the user interface, um, basically make sure that the quality, you know, the details, that is really good over time. That's what Mini needed. because. Quite frankly, frankly, Frank Stevenson, you know, uh, Frank and, and Garrett, you know, they made sure that the exterior was great at Mini. People love Minis. I love Minis. I, I would buy them. We have several Minis in our driveway. We love Minis. It's no problem. But um, the real job at hand as I was Mini Design Chief was not to reinvent the wheel so much. It was to help everybody in marketing or in uh, in production or the design team to follow up on the interior quality because that was what was missing really make sure when you get inside of a mini you close the door and it says you touch the materials and you're like yeah and you find the, the quirky solutions and the stuff you know headlights i mean we did, we did. I mean, we did a little more on the Countryman, obviously. But on the Clubman, if you look at the front, it's a very quiet, subdued front end, which was the target and which we wanted to do. Still interesting to look at. 
but it's not, uh, uh, hi, I'm a mini, <laughs> you know, no. Because mini is like, uh, like Porsche as well, I would say. It's like, whatever you do, make sure that you don't lose people. You know, it would be a grave shame if, if uh, such an important brand like Mini all of a sudden would have a lot of people go like, I don't recognize it as a Mini anymore. That would be, I don't think that's the right thing to do. I think Mini and Porsche and those should be, they should be what they are. I'm uh, not too, I, I'm, I'm, I, I said already that I'm a big fan of the, the Gina mm -hmm. and I, I don't, to my knowledge, there's not any other even concept that's dared to attempt what that car attempted. <laughs> but it's not just for me. It it, it also proportionally. It just I I think it looks great. You know, mm. given the limitations of everything, I think it. Well, well, let's put it this way: proportions. I mean, it was so. I don't want to say easy, but it was. It was like uh, strawberry ice cream, right? Take a Z8 chassis and do something with it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I like that. So we got that part. That was, I don't want to say it's easy, but it was okay. But the point about it is that um, um, it was a frustratingly difficult project because the theory of the surface language, which is obviously well beyond flame surfacing, which is basically steel metal in a different shape or form. Have a, have a rocker line or whatever, that's fine. But... Um, um, Gina was like, you know, a material way of doing shapes. And obviously Chris also talks a lot about that. Uh, still is his also, his, really his brainchild together with Fernando Pardo, who, who really invented it together with Chris. You know? So that's, that's obviously where it was born. Yeah, the idea was born with Fernando Pardo and John Krieger, two designers at uh, DesignWorks. The idea of what can you do uh, with... Uh, what if shape is not made from hard shapes like steel or wood or whatever? What if it's like clothes, flexible? What if it's ever changing? The morphing idea of like, now I'm closed, now I'm open, that kind of stuff. Um, that whole philosophy and Chris went into that. And, uh, and I, I was uh, involved in it later. And obviously, as you should probably know, we did it, you know, in, in the early 2000s. It wasn't until 2007 that it was even shown to the public. The car had been done like five years. It had been in the basement for a long, many, many years. The actual concept car was done. Uh, we've, 2000, I don't know, one, two, three, some, somewhere around there, we finished the car. And, um, and it was more of the, it was less about the car. It was more the philosophy and, you know, Fernando's vision and, 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 uh, Chris's vision or whatever. So we were, we were working together as a team and we were, I think, trying to be as respectful to one another to make sure that everyone's doing his. And Fernando finished the interior and I was then asked to do the, do the exterior on it because I had some sketches on it that people liked and they got selected. And then we worked together. And the frustrating thing about it is you don't see the car until the last five minutes. I didn't even see it, I think, because the point is you're working with an Eiffel Tower I mean, you have a chassis, a Z8 up on pins, no wheels, right? And now there's a guy who comes with, you know, steel bars and we're just shaping it. And he's like, okay, so we weld, spot weld here, you know. Uh, and, and it was just like, okay. So usually when you work in lines in clay, whatever, you, you got the brown surface connecting it. Now you're just working with splines. But it's not like an alias where you can say like, hide the rest, I just want to see the spline. You got a, you're looking through this Eiffel Tower, you got a workshop behind it. You got an old chassis. You can't, you can't just hit hide. Get it away. I just want to see the car. Hard unselected. Yeah. You can't do that because you got this, you know, dirty old workshop where people are welding. So it's, you're, you're basically working away on it. But it's not even like, you know, the custom bike guys where you can actually, you know, doom, 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 see the, the shape or the carrozzeria guys that could actually shape the fender even though it's, it's a great <laughs> dirty workshop. With Gina, it was like, you were just working with lines. We had this. We're looking at that and imagining what the surface would do. And then we had all these like clips where we would clip on like a square piece of material and kind of see what, what it would do. 
Yeah, I think this is a good position. Hold it here, hold it here. Okay, weld it. And then you weld it and then, you, and then you're playing around with it. And whenever you came back from lunch, you know, you know, all the material was off again. You had, you were back to an Eiffel Tower because they had to do something else. And this is the other thing. You're working with the material and welding. That means you have to take off the cloth all the time because when you weld, you got all the sparks yeah. and they make holes in the, and there's a plastic material. So whenever a spark would go on that, it would burn a brown hole like this. So they would always take stuff off, re-weld it, put another sheet on, put the clips on, you look at it, you go to lunch, everything stripped off. It was in that regard a little bit frustrating because you never really saw the shape until the last. Actually, I don't think I ever saw the finished car because I had to go back to California. So I just saw the pictures from the penthouse when it was finished. Were there scale versions of that? Yes, I did a scale model uh, of the Gina car, uh, of the exterior in clay, which Chris hated. I was like, yeah, but he hated the idea and I totally understand that. He hated the idea of shaping the volumes in something malleable before you make it happen out of the cloth and the steel. So what I'm saying, but I need to know where the headlights come down and where the shape of our kidneys are because I had these like going like this and, and I want to know where the wheel arches are exactly because I want to know where the splines need to go, whatever. So I did a scale model at DesignWorks in California and we took points from that and we transferred that into to digital. And then actually I did a whole a chassis. I forgot about that. We did a whole chassis in, in, in CAS where we did from the clay splines, we did all basically the, the Fred Krueger style, just all these like, you know, structural shapes, um, bony stuff. And then they came and said, well, you're not going to get all the bony stuff because I wanted just to mill that whole chassis and then cover it with cloth. They said, no, no, we're not going to do that because we have all the movable parts. And the movable parts need to come out of, of, of like, I think, three or four or five millimeter. Um, I mean, we had two uh, great uh, model builders on this, Sven Lanchier and uh, uh, Christian Bischoff. Those two guys, Sven and Christian, they were welding on these wires for days and days. That was amazing. But yeah, I did a clay model before that. Yeah. I would love to see a project like that get attempted today. Oh, well, sure. I think there was a lot like that. I think, but I mean, the thing is, we were at the time more or less digital in the process, obviously. Right? We were much more uh, hands on 3D in how we did things. No, I just, for me, that, 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 that car is fascinating because I don't think anybody else is, is dared to attempt to redo that um, an exterior in, in, in material, you know, they're starting to Since explore. the Hindenburg went down, people <laughs> said, no, 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 we can't do that. No, the point is really, um, there was a lot of airplanes in the thirties, wings that were like skeletal with, with covered, uh, cloth, you know, flying. If you think about it. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, um, and obviously the Hindenburgs and those kinds of things, but, um, for a car, obviously it's, it's, uh, it's quite unique. Well, let's, you know, be, before we get too philosophical, every soft top car has Gina on the roof, right? Right. Same thing. You design something. It wasn't until the Porsche 911 where they actually have these, you know, crowned panels underneath. So it actually looks like a coupe, but you could fold it. Okay. But up until then, same thing with the Z4 or whatever. I mean, we do the soft top on it before the retractable hard tops, obviously. Okay. You, you always have these like tent structures. So you, you give the cross blind and you, you kind of hope for the best. Then you see the first prototypes of your soft top and hopefully it looks good. You don't know. So actually every soft top is Gina. That's a very interesting analogy. And, and I have a Gina car at home myself anyways. I showed that to Chris. He was like, um, I have the first generation Porsche Spider. You know that one with the bikini top? Oh, wow. Yeah. So I love that car. And it's super lightweight, super fast or whatever. But the thing I just, I like, again, also these kinds of cars, right? So... When I saw that car, uh, I think it's a, a Grant Larson pet peeve project at Porsche, take a Boxster, take the soft top away and just give it a bikini top and just stretch it down with, a, with the power of the uh, trunk lid. And it's actually a um, super, uh, let's say, uh, illogical thing to do because obviously the Spider, you can't drive more than 120, maybe 110, 120 with a soft top on because everything is going right because it really is you got front windscreen and you got a hook in the back and you just got a tarp over that's how the 
And um, but it's safe. The reason why it's such a cool car is that the Porsche, the first Boxster, before it became, you know, regular. Now it's got an almost normal soft top, so it doesn't really make sense. Uh, but the first gen is you take everything out that's metal on the on the on the soft top, and you save. I think from the top itself, forty five or fifty kilos in just metal parts. That's high up, uh, high center of gravity. So you take that out. That's why the Spider, the first gen, is such a lightweight feeling car. Because right. you save over 50, I think it's 50 or 70 kilos over the regular Boxster. And it's and it feels nimble. It's also lowered this much. Super light. It's got aluminum doors, uh, carbon bucket seats. Um, no soft top, just a bikini. And, uh, and a small tank. And, and it goes like... It's got also an engine with a little with a lighter flywheel or whatever so everything is more like ding, like this and so anyways i have that car and i was at chris's house like a couple of years ago we had a painting session with jujaro came to that painting session by the way. that's cool um but then we, we were painting uh, uh the uh, chris was doing like a uh, what do you call it? a charity event for the local government so he asked some people he knew car designers to come and draw artwork of the landscape of the Italian landscape. So we flew, we drove down there and a um, couple of Giolito from the Fiat or whatever and uh, Giugiaro was there as well and I, I got to paint, whatever. And then on the Sunday, our paintings were auctioned off and all the income from that was given to the local city for a, a good cause. So That's that was awesome. kind of nice. Cool. And it was beautiful, beautiful paintings. Anyways, on that event, I, I, was, I drove down there in the box the spider and Chris, he's like, what are you doing with that stupid car? You know, like... I don't know if he wants to be quoted on that. He, but he didn't like it. He said, uh, "I remember uh, this other guy." He said, "I don't, I don't think Chris likes your car." I was like, "Yeah, but Chris, it's got Gina on the roof," and he's like, "Yeah, I'll give you that, but I don't like the car." <laughs> Alice, I wanted to. Um, I think I, uh, there's there's a lot of students that watch this, hopefully, and. Um, I, it's a very complicated landscape finishing university now and, and entering into the world of, of car design. A lot more courses. The jobs arguably got more, a lot more complex. Um, or maybe that's just our perception. What would your advice be to kids starting out now? Oh, that's nice. Yeah, actually, um, honestly, I think it's as difficult as, as it ever were, but it, it's not gotten more difficult, I would even say. It's just more, and there's a, there are more opportunities today, uh, more tools, more in-betweens, more casts, whatever. Uh, when I came out of school in the 90s, it was more like either you got a job as a car designer sketching or you don't. It's kind of black and white. Now you got all these in-between experience, storyboarding, blah, 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 cast modeling, whatever. So you can kind of like flank the whole topic. So I do think that there's a more of a... Uh, a wider range of integration of creative talent into the uh, art or car or design industry anyways. Um, so I don't see it uh, difficult in that regard. Um, that being said, people could say, well, that's easy for me to say, but actually I say, no, it's, I, I'm, I got warming design. I'm on the market. I, I have to uh, make ends meet too, right? So I know exactly, I'm not on a payroll anywhere, right? So I got to make things work, you know? And so I know that things are tough, but they've always been tough. So in that regard, I think the only advice, or not only, I can give several advices, but the main advice I really want to give is stop this thing. I'm not saying that to you. I'm saying that to everybody else. Stop this thing about uh, saying, you know, I can't draw. I just the weirdest thing. I've met so many people. I'm not even talking about you as designers, whatever. Other people that will just say, yeah, man, I can't draw. I'm like, what I'm saying is that if Bob Dylan can sing, and we agree he can sing, right? He's on this wall, I know. But if Bob Dylan can sing, everyone can draw. If you got something to say, sing it. You know? So it's you we gotta draw. We gotta keep drawing. And everyone can draw. And everyone should draw. And obviously, I grew up sketching a lot, so I don't. There's no excuses from my side, anyways. 
So if people want to make their, um, their way into the industry, draw, draw, draw. I don't care if you got Adobe, you know, uh, you know, whatever, abonnement, what is it called? Uh, Photoshop. Uh, uh, oh, well, uh, uh, the the yeah, uh, you got uh, subscription. Or you, I don't care how many software you have on a computer or whatever. It does not matter. I have software here. I have software there. But what I have is that white piece of paper and my big ballpoint pen. And that will make sketches. And that, a lot of times, is worth more to a lot of people than some of the... We can even argue that that's not a pretty sketch. I would even agree. No, oh, it's not very nice. But you can't argue that there's not a lot of soul in that sketch. That's just... That, that's a sketch. So it's A4 pieces of paper. It's copy paper and it's big. It costs cents. We don't need no, any subscription. No subscription is all in your mind. You don't need 3D, it's in here. You know, so it's sketching, 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 draw, draw, draw. If Bob Dylan can sing, I can draw. And Bob Dylan can sing. He has got a lot to say. He's changed the world with his voice. You know, it's beautiful. So it's so I think it's so important that that we don't we don't yeah, there's this beauty discussion thing, like uh, you know. You get a great idea, you got a piece of paper, you can put it on paper. Uh, it doesn't have to be the you know, that's why people like doodles, quick sketches, because those are like, you know, in the 90s, obviously, uh, he is a musician, you know. In the 90s, when, when Unplugged started, it was like after all the people that had just been producing and producing. I remember some of the later um, or early 90s Pink Floyd albums was all about, well, we went into the studio and we recorded for six months and we were dialing in the triple and this and that and we took out some bass and whatever and we spent six months on polishing up this album and people were like hmm, i like the wall better yeah but yeah but that was more like unplugged yeah you know it's not my favorite album but i i, I love i love eric clapton of course but eric clapton unplugged one of the most sold albums of all time a guy I, ironically that's the that's the album that was the first thing that i was exposed to of his and i didn't i had no idea up until i got a bit older uh, that um that he was you know actually about cream, and, cream, and, that, and cream and that he was this hard oh, rocker you know cream. i didn't like it was so i like the first picture that i saw of him was him oh, oh, looking God. like an a um, librarian you know and he was a but here's another one, anyways, that doesn't have the prettiest voice in the world, um, but just got stories and 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 he captured. I I do like that. I would say I like sixty percent of the unplugged album. The rest is a little bit repetitive or whatever. That's fine. But um, but it it was a reminder. And uh, Nirvana was a reminder of you. You know, forget all that Bon Jovi stuff, White Snake or whatever. That's rock and roll. Garage grunge Seattle. That's rock and roll. You know. So that's. To the sketching, grunge, you know, Nirvana, Pink Floyd, The Wall, which was also produced, but, you know, this Dark Side of the Moon or whatever. But, you know, I still listen to the first Beatles albums. I don't know. I'm I, was, I was listening to it today. Yeah, I've, 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 I listen to all those things. I, I, I mean, I, I love, I love the, obviously, Abbey Road, you know, the final and the way it all came together, whatever. And it's well produced and something is beautiful song. And it's all, here comes the sun. It's all pretty and polished, whatever. But those sessions, you know, one day sessions, you know, Please Please Me album or Beatles for Sale or whatever, in the studio, four guys going for it. And, and, and the reverb is the room. It's, there's no button. Reverb is the room, you know. Well, they did have a, they had a reverb room, right? So they fed it into a speaker, into the reverb room, put mics, so it sounded like a bathroom in there with tiles on it, and fed that back into the four-track record to get that, that, uh, that stadium sound. Anyway, so, um, um, yeah, you, you can play Unplugged. And our sketching tool is, and this is my, my advice to any designer or any musician, whatever, grab a guitar, write a song, or grab a piece of paper and do a sketch. Sketch all the way. That's my main advice. And if you can do 8,000 sketches, it's probably better than eight. And I'm probably on the far side of the 8,000. And that's why I can hold my own on it. But um doesn't mean that I'm a great designer or whatever. It just means that I feel comfortable when I sketch. 
I feel like I'm able to, uh, you know, when I sketch, I, th I, want, I don't want to go to, into too much detail about that, but really it does happen. Well, that's that thing called the flow, when you get in the flow. The minute you get in the flow of sketching is usually after the 25th sketch or something like that. You have to get warm. Like that third sketch, you go like, I'm done. That never happens for me. I always say, keep going, keep sketching, keep sketching. My walls are full of sketches. So I just say, even though I might like the third sketch or the 12th sketch, I will keep going to past 50. And then the interesting thing is I usually look at the early sketches and I say, yeah, it got better later. So I might like them in the moment. It's like, oh, this is really cool. I'll look at that spoiler or whatever. And once you start, you you get in the flow. Right? What happens is on that piece of paper, this again, this is why I like to sketch on black uh, tables. Because the white paper is for me a window to the world. Follow me on this. The, the white paper is the space underneath the black table. And that's where my 3D happens. So I'm just making image of what I see through the table. So you're, you're seeing through the paper. Gosh, and yeah. when you see through the paper, obviously you don't see the grain of the paper because it's, the f it's like your screen on a television. It's basically the window to the world. So that's how I think about the, the, the white pieces of A4 paper. It's, that's what I need to look through that. And there I can look front three quarter side, rear three quarter top, rear three. I can turn it just like we do in Alias, just swivel it around. It just takes eight sketches to get eight views, right? And alias, you can just take your mouse and just go like, shush, 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 shush. now I've seen it. That you got to do it by hand. And the interesting thing is you start, um, um, you know, sketches are malleable. You start adjusting the plan view of the rear fender or whatever when you sketch on paper. So that's why I say the, the sum of sketching is uh, to try and look through the paper, try to blur your view. A lot of times when I sketch, I actually see myself kind of like looking up, a little blurry almost. Just kind of imagining, feeling the shape underneath the table in that regard. So sketch, 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 sketch. On paper, um, one. And the other one, I don't even know how to say that shortly, but it'll, I need to reference what I just said. Make sure you don't sketch to cater to other people's tastes. Make sure that you please yourself, your gut feeling, your own belief, you know. And when you become a design manager, make sure to remember to make your young designers like what they sketch. That's what Chris did to us. You know, make sure that, well, if I want to feel good about the sketches I want to, because I'm the young designer, right? Now I'm the design boss. I've been, you know, obviously design boss for many years. I'm not allowed to forget the feeling of sitting and providing, you know, pouring my heart and soul out on a sketch or whatever. You know, I have to remember and say, I want to listen to his gut feeling, not my gut feeling. Okay, I might make a decision and say, we're going to go this way or that way or that way. That's fine. That's my job, obviously. But as a design boss later, once you start climbing the ladder, remember how it feels to you know, when you, how you feel naked and exposed when you hang up your favorite sketch and someone goes like, you know, I don't like that. You go like, oh, okay. Right. It really is about listening to, not, don't say, oh, I don't like that. Rather say to the person, why did you do that? Tell me what's, what went into that. That's how a Chris would think, you know, he would also kick us. If we were the successful ones, he would kick us. But the people that were in the, not doing so well in sketching and feeling insecure, he would take an hour. Like it was beautiful. I mean, okay, no, uh, that's a beautiful thing. That's a really, that's really, a really I mean, we were, I mean, let's say I could consider my one of the, the successful guys at the time. So I had stuff. Oh, he would kick us all the time. Ah, and I was, what the fuck? I was like, ah, you know, you can do better. Come on, come on. Why are you doing this? Come on, whatever. And I'd go like, and, and if he felt that I get kind of sad about it, you know, obviously he would hold back, but he knew I could take it. But there are some other people that might not feel as comfortable or confident about things. And he would go like, oh, look at that sketch. That's a beautiful little sketch, little stuff. I remember he even picked sketches from the wall, like these thumbnails from, from some designers that say, well, I'm not quite sure. I was like, I really like that sketch. Let's do that little sketch full size. You know, like give them the stage, give people the room. So that's why I say when you, when you sketch yourself, think about what you like. 
If you later are in project management or in managerial roles, don't forget that feeling. Make sure the people around you feel empowered to also bring their thumbnails to the table. It's not about, well, only take the pretty sketches. You, you, you have to make sure everyone comes to the table. That's why I like someone like Anne Forschner or whatever once he joined, because he's like, you give her, you know, you got to give her, you should, did you see her uh, um, um, uh, student project she did? Oh, it's, it's amazing. Lovas, yeah. yeah. So, and Lovas, she did that uh, in my team, but with a guy, uh, another designer, really like Per Selvak, a Norwegian guy, Per. You should do a podcast with him. He's oh, well, we can talk about that, but I'd love to, yeah. yeah per Selvag is really good, but he was her mentor, right? So Per was supporting her on that. And I mean, you know, that's like, he was really good at getting her to come out. You know, I mean, she was she was an excellent designer anyways, but, but not to be, you know, just give her a stage and say, what do you want to do? And then he helped her make her design better. And that's what I want to say, because she knew she was good. But you need someone to pull it out of you and give you a stage, you know. That's what we as, as design managers have to think about. Now it's not about me and my gut feeling anymore. It's about yours and yours and yours and give you guys a stage, you know. When you said that, it made me think of um, when uh, apparently uh, Madonna went to Nile Rogers and she was like, oh, I've got the best album oh. already. And he was like, it's good, but I we can make it better yeah. and and he helped her yeah. bring that to, it's Nile uh, Rogers is in many regards exactly what it's all about the guy he just took any band whether it was obviously chic but that was his own band but anyways the the Madonna stuff the 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 in excess Duran Duran all that stuff he brought them all up to a level okay you can kind of tell that he'd been involved but it wasn't until much later I found out that you know Bowie. I didn't know that he wasn't involved with NXS, for example. But now that you say yeah. it, it, it makes sense. I, like I need you tonight. Need you tonight, need you tonight riff, yeah. But uh, but especially uh, um, um, I, as a kid, I l grew up listening to the Bowie "Let's Dance" album, right? With all the hits, "China Girl," "Let's Dance," whatever, and the sound of that "Modern Love" or whatever, and I'm like. Oh, that's Nile Rogers too. I didn't know. It makes total sense, right? Yeah. I mean, he even when he does his uh, his concerts, it's great. He starts out by saying, "I'm the most famous guy nobody knew," you know. Uh, but but uh, it's not. No. Um, what was that? He I saw an interview with him. Where he was saying that that that, that he was uh, he was referred to as this uh, um, uh, this cover band because he was playing all these hits from the '80s, right? But they didn't realize he'd done them all, right? right. So uh, there's Duran Duran or Madonna or whatever. But I mean, Nile Rogers is one of the most eloquent, uh, deep human beings. I love his interviews. I really, really, really like to. Because also, he grew up in uh, New York. Uh, and his parents were parents, junkies, right? The what? I think his parents were junkies. Well, junkies. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but grew up, and, but his, his stepdad was all into Miles Davis and knew Miles Davis apparently or whatever. So he, would, so he was around the whole jazz scene in the village or whatever. And pff, great. I mean, really insp inspirational. So I'm glad you brought him up because I think it's, that, it's the best example of somebody who really knows what he likes but then is able to get the most out of other people. And I'll be the first one. I'm sure there's 10 people or more that will say, no, oh, Anders is very tough, whatever. Okay. You know, but I do, do, do try to uh, really live by that old, by my own doctrine and say, okay, I might be quick. I might be tough. I might be uh, pushy. I, I'm known as a person who really pushes. I know, but I really, really try to do it to get the most out of, you and these guys and everyone to elevate things like we did with Isabella or the Buddha Mini or whatever. I pride myself on that, I think, to create a stage and help people to make the best. So that's why to your question, where, who's the most influential person? I say for sure, Chris, because he did that to us and I'm hoping to pay back that, spending a lot of time with young designers that work for me or whatever to teach them about things I know, you know, pass it forward kind of thing. And this, we have run out of time, but I, I, um, I absolutely enjoyed every minute of this, and it was an honor to just sit here and listen to this stuff. And I can only thank you. No, oh, it's okay. It was great. It was a, and yeah, to have us in your beautiful place, and 
yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I don't really, I'm, I'm speechless. It's just, it was, it was really good. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are going to get a lot out of this. And if they don't, they are stupid. <laughs> No, it's a pleasure meeting you guys. And I think the, the, the effort you guys did coming down here and, and setting it up, I totally appreciate it. It is nice to talk about some of these things because usually I don't really talk so much about, let's say, the beginnings or whatever, blah, blah, blah. I do think that the next time I need to spend some more time, maybe uh, be a little more open about, let's say, the Z4, what went into it, because it it seems like a lot of, or oh, Gina. Gina maybe less because I would say that's really also Fernando's brainchild or whatever uh chris's brainchild i was more like a support act on that i would say i'm a, i designed the exterior but philosophically i was i was you know i was a wingman right um but on the on the z4 i was definitely uh out ahead on that and this is probably something i need to speak a little bit more about so i appreciate you also giving me that stage to share it a little bit and uh, we'll take no, it from the, there. The, the pleasure is yeah the pleasure and the honor is all mine so thank you yeah yeah cool and I, I, I hope one day you're going to like the DS. I, I, it's, I feel like an idiot now for making that statement, but I, I also got to this point. I, I got to the point. No, honestly, listen, I got to the point we'll get where it. I'm like, I'm done dancing on the edge of politically correctness with this stuff. Like there's certain, there's certain cars that I think are fucking terrible. And I'm, for, I'm, I'm, I'm opening my mind it's to everything it. But but I just, it's no, everything but that. It's everything but that. Oh, you know who's very eclectic about taste? He doesn't have a DS, I think. But anyways, I, I saw that part, uh, no, uh, that uh, YouTube film with uh, Mr. JWW with uh, Guy Berman from Coldplay. Okay. Um, Coldplay. Yeah, I know you, him, but, I, don't, but I, know, I, 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 I only know Chris Martin out of that band. Yeah, but I'm not Guy a- Berman, that actually, honestly, I'm not a Coldplay fan at all, really. But after I got into Guy Berryman as a car guy doing the Road Rat magazine, all that kind of stuff. Right. I actually got back into uh, Coldplay and I actually kind of like a lot of that stuff again right. now. And it, because I was kind of like, they did this la- last thing right now in Beirut or somewhere on the, on the top of the mountains. Beautiful, right. really well done. Anyways, but Guy Berryman, he has a very collective uh, um, uh, taste in cars. Citroen SM or... Uh, Zagato Porsches or whatever, really, really like high level stuff. That guy, man, phew. I mean, I, I like that and rather than 100 cars and it's all, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, Porsche 2.7 RS, whatever. It's, I know, I got it, right? But JK's collection is good, you know, very classic. That's pretty good, yeah. Very, but there's a lot of money thrown at that collection as well. But Yeah, but I think actually a lot of it generated money. You right, know, yeah, way. sure. You got a Pullman, sold it. I guess it was Karl Lagerfeld's Pullman or whatever. But um, I think... Um, That's also another just absolute his original, Maserati. true, true artist as well. Who? JK. JK is unbelievable. It's just, the funny thing is I grew up um, at Art Center... And we were listening. That's back when his music was called Acid Jazz. Yes, I remember that. Like, ver- like the, the, yeah, they were when calling you go, it. Yeah. When we're going to learn or uh, Emergency on Planet Emergency Earth. Emergency on Planet Earth. And that yeah. album was playing nonstop when I was sketching at Art Center. There's a really cool interview with him around that time. It's not like a bonus feature on this, this disc that they, that they put out where he was talking about... Um, uh, global warming at that time and, and basically what we th- that's what that whole emergency of planet earth he knew I mean I, 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 a lot of people knew obviously but as an artist anyways but JK is definitely uh, inspirational musically or whatever did you see that interview where they trashed uh, that Lamborghini SV at the uh, did you hear that story no anyways I might get it all wrong but the point was they uh, they did the video for the Cosmic Girl and they were bu- oh yeah 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 and the, and, the, and they and flew the wind- down and he came down to Spain and they had actually damaged the car and it was completely yes. so he- the music video he there's no windscreen exactly. in the front but he said but that was the second car yeah because he said he said like if he's like nobody touched the car until I get there exactly. and they were like yeah yeah yeah, yeah right. sure because the first one was trashed and as you said they showed up and they did it again and they were like fuck it we're gonna have to f- uh, shoot film. like this and the, there's no windscreen in the front you can see his hair like Diablo SV yeah. a car that I'm also slowly warming up to again I have to say the Diablo it's been off my radar for so long but there's always cars always cars anyways pleasure Thanks you guys Dude, for taking I, the time. I, I, I really, it was, it was. It's a wrap.